Welcome to our third quarter wealth management market update. My name is Jeffrey Smith. I'm the executive vice president and head of our wealth management group. Today, I'm joined by Ryan Hanna. Ryan, Ryan is a senior vice president, our deputy chief investment officer, and director of equities. I'm also joined by Carrie Mooney, senior vice president and chief deposit officer, and Rachel Ela. First Vice President and Associate Director of our Premier Client Group. First off, I'd like to thank all of our clients, my Cambridge Trust colleagues, and all of our professional accountant and attorney partners for joining us today. Since this is my first time hosting the market update, I would like to provide a quick background on my experience and the reasons why I chose to join Cambridge Trust. I was born and raised in Wellesley, Massachusetts. I received an economics major at the University of Vermont. I started my career with Scudder Stevens and Clark in 1987, right here in Boston, Massachusetts. And I spent the last 23 years of my career at Rockland Trust, where we were successful in growing a wealth management firm within a commercial bank. So why did I join Cambridge Trust Company? And you will note a common theme here. That theme is the integration of wealth management and private banking. So first off, Cambridge Trust has been providing private banking and wealth management services since, excuse me, 1890, with a legacy of financial strength, credibility, and stability throughout economic cycles. The second reason I joined is with the recent disruption in the private banking market, Cambridge Trust really is in a perfect position to serve the high net worth and institutional client base who have been displaced by firms who are no longer serving this market. And third, comes from McKinsey and Company, a global management consulting firm, and I will quote, the convergence of banking and investing has gone mainstream. There has been a striking increase in clients' preference to consolidate their banking and wealth management to achieve convenience. Clients prefer to place investments with a firm where they also have a banking relationship. So today, you will hear about Cambridge Trust expertise in wealth management, that's Ryan, followed by how we seamlessly integrate private banking, that's Carrie and Rachel, into our client relationships. So before I turn over the program, just two housekeeping items. Number one, is there is a question and link at the bottom of your screen. We'd ask that you please use this link for any questions you have for our team, and we will field them as time allows at the end of our commentary. And then secondly, uh, the webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on Cambridge Trust website uh, following the conclusion of today's program. So let me now introduce Ryan Hanna for our third quarter market update. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking to you about some of the changing dynamics in today's market, maybe reflect a bit on how we got here, touch a little bit on the surprisingly strong first half of 2023, and then share some insights into the second half of the year. Uh, I'll briefly review some normalization trends we're seeing in the market, and then address a handful of risks we're monitoring and finish with some key reasons to be optimistic. Uh, reiterating what Jeff said, I'd encourage everybody to use the Q&A function at the bottom uh, to ask questions throughout the presentation. So uh, the economy and the markets have been in a transitional phase. Uh, we've been digesting years of excesses and abnormalities due to extremely easy monetary policies going back to the great financial crisis. This long period of low interest rates combined with massive amounts of stimulus during the COVID crisis resulted in our current fiscal situation, which is higher inflation and record debt levels. These, these issues were front and center last week when Fitch Rating Agency lowered the debt rating of the US government by one notch from AAA to AA plus. To be fair, the debt downgrade wasn't a complete surprise and markets took the reduction mainly in stride. Yields rose modestly, stocks fell about 1% following the announcement. Back in 2011, Standard & Poor's also lowered its rating agents, uh, its rating on sovereign debt by a similar one notch during the debt ceiling debates back then. 
but it was a strong reminder for the U.S. to get its fiscal house in order and address the long-term spending issues that have been created over time. To paraphrase the Fitch rating commentary, the ratings downgrade reflected the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing government debt burden, and the erosion of governance relative to AA and AAA rated peers over the last two decades that has manifested in repeated debt limit standoffs and last minute resolutions. This down debt downgrade follows the July 31st announcement by the US Treasury Department that it expects to borrow more than $1 trillion in privately held net marketable debt between July and September of this year. Given the increase in interest rates over the last year or so, we now need to fund this debt at much higher interest rates. Uh, the first slide I'll reference, slide three in the deck, shows federal interest paid on our government debt. This is through April 1st, 2023, and doesn't account for the more recent bond issuances. Clearly, the trend has gone parabolic and likely will get worse as rates rise. The lower debt rating uh, issued by um, Fitch may increase funding costs, meaning investors will demand higher yields to invest in U.S. Treasuries, leading to even higher interest costs on our debt in the future. So how did we get here? World of higher interest rates and higher inflation. Following the great financial crisis, interest rates were held artificially low for well over a decade, courtesy of the Federal Reserve, quantitative easing, and easy money policies. This encouraged risk-taking, adding leverage and taking on debt at historically low levels, and was broadly supportive of risk assets. TINA was the acronym used frequently at the time. There is no alternative to stocks. As a result, the period between 2010 and 2020 was robust for stock owners, but not so great for bondholders or savers. Inflation was nowhere to be seen. Stimulative actions taken during COVID seemed necessary, but the future implications of printing so much money wasn't entirely clear at the time. The unprecedented amount of fiscal and monetary st stimulus, trillions of dollars, distribu distributed through government channels to combat the challenges of COVID and keep the economy afloat proved successful in the early days. Yet as time went on and we added more dollars, to each incremental stimulus package, the result was a massive liquidity bubble. Consumers and corporations were awash in cash, and this transfer of money from the government to consumers created a spending boom. Spending boom skewed everything from asset prices to supply chains, car prices, inventories, and commodity prices. The significant rise in the money supply, combined with the dislocations in the labor market, associated with COVID created an inflationary spike unlike anything we've seen since the early 1980s. Uh, the next three slides, slides four, five, and six, I'll reference pretty quickly, uh, but you'll see a similar pattern across all three charts. Uh, on slide four, we can look at uh, supply chain pressures. So as I referenced, one of the, the imp implications of uh, too much buying was uh, pressure on the supply chain. So the blue line on, on slide four shows a pretty stable supply chain until COVID hit and then it spiked. And now it has resumed uh, kind of a normal, more normalized level uh, within, the, within the supply chain. Next page on page five shows retail spending. Again, with all the money that, that consumers had in their pockets, you can see uh, retail sales basically were flat between zero and 5% for the better part of the last 10 years. When COVID hit, sales spiked, went through the roof and have now come down and normalized. And then the third chart is inflation, CPI. And again, the chart looks very similar. Um, 20, even 30 years of pretty tame and modest inflation prior to COVID. And then once COVID hit, we saw a spike in headline inflation to 9%. And now we've seen moderation back towards 3%. So I would just say there's a lot of similarities when I talk about normalization. We've seen uh, spikes, bubbles, and then normalization and, and a lot of these trends coming back to normal. To combat the growing inflationary pressures, the Fed began raising rates. Starting in March of 2022, the Fed began a very aggressive tightening campaign and financial conditions tightened alongside. The Fed raised rates 525 basis points over a 17 month period to its current effective rate of 5.25 to five and a half. 
As previously shown in the CPI chart, the rate hikes appeared to have generally been successful in cooling inflation, but at what cost? Since June of 22, when inflation peaked at 9%, markets have been attempting to normalize. Inflation in its simplest form is just too many dollars chasing too few goods. And this is precisely what we saw happen. Money supply, or M2, surged as the Fed pumped liquidity into the markets. The excess money from COVID payments went into consumer savings accounts and was used, was used to buy a lot of stuff, which led to the supply chain problems, inventory shortages, and problems at our ports. In effect, the combined actions of government, consumers, and corporations during COVID sowed the seeds for the inflationary buildup and set off an extraordinary Fed campaign to raise rates to stem all of those inflationary pressures. However, the Fed campaign to raise rates began a transition period back to normal. Interest rates are now normalizing from 0% to something higher. The past decade of easy money with quantitative easing, holding the Fed funds at zero and mortgage rates below 3% are now all likely over. Consumers are also normalizing behaviors and spending levels. The process of unwinding the excesses of the past COVID period and getting back to some form of normalcy continue to this day. I'll share a couple of trends with you uh, in terms of other normalization trends that we see out in the marketplace. Uh, I've mentioned the mortgage rate uh, situation. Um, we've seen mortgage rates climb in some cases above 7%. Uh, most people believe 3% was sort of abnormal and not a normal rate uh, of where long-term rates should be. Uh, one positive takeaway of that is most homeowners in the United States were savvy enough, smart enough to secure fixed rate mortgages uh, at very, very low rates. So the increase in interest rates uh, on mortgage rates hasn't impacted existing homeowners, but would impact any new homeowners or new buyers uh, to the marketplace. Consumer behavior. So con consumers are reverting to pre-COVID routines. We're seeing a lot more dining out, a lot more traveling, going to concerts, and opting for experiences versus goods. People bought enough stuff during COVID that the consumption of goods will likely take a back seat for a few years, and services will likely pick up the slack. In this regard, we'll need to monitor inflation on the service side of the equation. Healthcare trends are normalizing as well. Patients postpone medical procedures, delayed or skipped doctor visits due to health-related issues during COVID. Now treatments and procedures are rising again, putting added costs on insurance uh, on insurers and hospitals. Inpatient and ER visits are both approaching pre-COVID levels. Uh, the Federal Reserve is also in the early stages of right-sizing its balance sheet, but this may take years. After many years of purchasing bonds and growing the balance sheet to ensure liquidity in a fragile market, this trend too is normalizing. The next two slides, slides seven and eight, I would like to touch on briefly as well. This shows some normalization in consumer financing. So on the left side of this chart, we have the personal savings rate. And you can see uh, we, we troughed somewhere around the great financial crisis in 2007, 2008 at about 3% of disposable personal income. That level spiked following COVID, and you can see that one uh, line going up to about 17% uh, in the heat in the midst of COVID. And now we've come all the way back down to where we were. The chart in the top right, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, this is excess savings. So if you follow the blue line, the personal savings rate or the, person, the amount of personal savings ballooned from about $1.5 trillion dollars to almost six and a half trillion dollars during COVID. The blue bubble will show you what, what we refer to as peak excess savings. So that's savings above sort of what a normalized rate of savings would be. The point from mid 2021 through 2023, we've seen consumers continue to spend, which has supported our economy and kept the markets fairly resilient. That too is normalizing. We are getting very close to the point where uh, that excess savings will be uh, will be gone and we'll be back to sort of normal levels of savings. Uh, the last chart in the bottom right here, just wanted to show consumer credit outstanding. 
uh, credit, consumer credit and revolving credit is rising, but it's rising from very, very low levels back to normal levels. So there's a very consistent theme here around normalization. We've gone from extremes back to normal in a lot of different places. On page eight, um, let's see, this is household debt service. And again, I think it just kind of proves the same point, which is we are seeing debt payments rise, but not to extreme levels. At the top, we saw 13.2% debt payments as a percent of disposable income at the height of the financial crisis. Today, we're below 10%. So still fairly good shape for the consumer. The last chart on the bottom of page eight, uh, delinquencies. So these are uh, balance, balances delinquent more than 30 days. Seen a little tick up in autos and in credit cards, but student loans remain uh, subdued. And that is for obvious reasons. We have had a moratorium on student loan payments for the past three years. That is set to expire in September of this year. So that number, I assume, will go much higher, maybe get back to that 9 or 10% level that we saw um, pre-COVID. Um, so a lot of these trends, certainly higher, but not alarming. So where are we today? Strength in the stock market this year has taken a lot of people by surprise. Following a pretty ugly year in 2022, 23 has been a welcome reprieve. Through August 4th, the S&P was up nearly 18% and the NASDAQ composite was up an impressive 33%. Despite such a strong start to the 2023 marketplace, there is a lot of underlying um, uncertainty uh, with but a lot for the, both the bulls and the bears to debate at this point. Sentiment has fluctuated since the beginning of the year. The recession camp has gone from a hard landing to no landing to a soft landing. For all the criticisms of the Fed over time, they seem to be threading the needle this time, at least so far, and the market is temporarily bought into the Goldilocks soft landing scenario. The Fed's dual mandate is price stability and maximum sustainable employment, and right now we're close to both. Magnificent Seven, as they're affectionately known. This is Apple and Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Meta. That represented the vast majority of the total S&P gains during the first half of this year. The other 490 stocks combined were essentially flat through June 30th. Accordingly, we've seen valuations for these mega cap tech stocks surge, while the rest of the market remains more reasonably valued. On the next chart, you can see uh, a graph, graphical depiction of these mega cap tech stocks. Uh, the price to earnings ratio of these high flying stocks trading at about 32 times expected earnings. The other 493 stocks in the market are trading it at about 17 times expected earnings. While the gains early in the year were very top heavy, participation has broadened out to more stocks and more sectors across the index since the end of June. Expanding breadth is a pretty healthy sign for the markets. So notwithstanding the Fitch debt downgrade of our sovereign debt last week and Moody's downgrade of 10 uh, regional banks yesterday, the S&P is only 2% off of the year-to-date peaks and is less than 6% from the all-time highs we saw at the beginning of 22. Impressive and resilient. The market, at least thus far, is taking this transition period in stride. But can it last? Which brings us to slide 10. I wanted to identify for you, uh, you know, some current risks that we're thinking about for the second half of 2023 and into 24. These are in no particular order, and I've grouped them into three different categories. I'll talk about just a couple of these. Uh, within the government and political uh, category, you know, we do have an upcoming election next year. That'll be something to be watchful for and mindful for. Uh, given how tumultuous the political landscape has been. We're very, very careful and mindful of the China-Taiwan situation and the ongoing conflict in Russia and Ukraine. That could have uh, pretty serious ramifications for the broader market domestically and internationally. So that is something that really needs to be watched very, very closely. Uh, I've talked about debt levels, so I'll skip over that. I've talked about the resumption of student loan payments, but that's worth mentioning again. The average student loan payment is about $400 a month. So for every person with a student loan, 
uh, that's $400 that was being spent in the economy that now will have to go back towards student loan payments. We view that as a clear headwind for consumer spending as we move into the third and fourth quarter. Within the markets category, we're, we're still dealing with a very inverted yield curve. And that has been a, a precursor to a recession. Uh, it has a pretty good track record of being a precursor for recessions. So um, that is another thing that we are very, very mindful of um, and will continue to watch. I also think regional banks is, is an issue. If you look at uh, my slide 11, um, I thought this was interesting. And, and again, this is not specific to commercial real estate exposure, but does give you some um, context around uh, vacancy rates for different property types. Um, you know, the takeaway here is office vacancy rates are elevated. They're above most other uh, types of properties. And we feel like that is a another considerable risk um, in the second half, well, maybe even more into 24 and 25. Uh, but it is something that we continue to monitor very, very closely. But there are reasons to be optimistic. So we have some very significant um, uh, projects like the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act that should provide short, intermediate, long-term benefits to the economy. As we bring more manufacturing back to the United States and become less dependent on China and other countries for uh, our supply chain, this will be a big benefit long-term for the United States. Generative AI, that's another huge uh, secular trend that we're watching. Um, and, and I'm sure everybody has read and heard much, much about that. Uh, I have a slide at the end that will talk to that uh, a little bit more. Um, within consumer, I mentioned that 90% of mortgages are, are, are fixed rate. I think that's a very, very important uh, thing for consideration. Within the markets aspect, um, corporate earnings are pretty solid. For the second quarter of 2023 will likely represent the bottom of the earnings uh, growth trajectory, and we're likely to see improvement in the back half. So. We believe stock prices follow corporate earnings, so this should be good for stock prices, in our opinion. All right, so uh, let me try and bring this in for a landing here. Um, it's important to keep in mind the markets are forward-looking. We've gotten through most of the Fed tightening cycle. Maybe there's another 25 or 50 basis points of hikes ahead, but we're much closer to the end, and the worst of the inflation situation is behind us. Corporate earnings and profit margins are likely to improve in the months ahead, but at current valuation levels, a lot of the good news is now embedded in stock prices. Uh, and less earnings can surprise to the upside, the best gains of the year have likely already been made. It is likely the period of easy money, low interest rates, and stimulus benefits has run its course and won't be the tailwind it has been for the last 15 years. As a result, it's reasonable to assume a period of slower growth, higher rates that we've been accustomed to, higher inflation and modestly lower asset prices ahead. This does not mean we should sell equities or move to cash, but just expect lower returns in the future. If you're a fixed income investor or desire greater current income, the Fed's actions over the last 17 months has been a godsend. Today, you can earn positive inflation adjusted returns with very little risk. Cash is yielding over 5%, and income on investment-grade corporate bonds is in the mid to upper single-digit range. Again, it's been more than a decade since we can say bonds have been this attractive on a yield basis. We'll be monitoring the employment picture and the jobs data pretty closely. This is likely one of the most important areas to focus on in the months ahead. One reason the recession forecasts have not materialized and have been pushed out time and time again is the resiliency of the job market. It's hard to have a recession with the unemployment rate at three and a half percent. Job gains have recently slowed and we're starting to see signs of fatigue in hiring. So this data point will be key to watch in the second half. In our business, there's always something to worry about and the complexities and challenges that face investors always seem daunting in the present and maybe less worrisome with some hindsight. We manage client portfolios to be weather resistant with the expectation that they should perform in good markets and, and preserve capital in bad markets. As David Lynch mentioned in our Q2 letter, 
client portfolios have been modestly underweight to equities, acknowledging many of the risks we discussed here today and the potential vulnerabilities we see in the economy. On the margin, we've been adding incrementally towards fixed income, given the more attractive opportunity set, and have added further diversification through some liquid alternatives. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague on the banking side, Kerry Mooney, to talk about uh, Cambridge Trust's holistic private banking approach and how we work together to benefit our collective clients. Thank you, Ryan. We can move forward one slide. Thank you so much. My name is Kerry Mooney, and I'm the Chief Deposit Officer at Cambridge Trust. And with me is Rachel Ela, Associate Director of Strategy and Manager of the Premier Client Group. At Cambridge Trust, we come together on behalf of our clients with extensive capabilities and a unique value as a private bank. You've experienced firsthand the strength of our team in support of your wealth goals and have benefited from the wisdom of many of my colleagues who collaborate to enhance your financial security. Just as you have many talented advisors in wealth, there's a broad team available to support your full banking needs. And today we'll expand upon our programs and invite you to reach out if our approach resonates with you. Cambridge Trust is known for its unique status in the market as a relationship-driven bank. Clients are drawn to us for a variety of reasons, but the most compelling of them are our four unique differentiators, our safety and security, our team expertise, our exceptional personal attention, and our personalized solutions. Safety and security has never been more important to our clients than now. As a company founded in 1890 with a conservative approach to banking, we have weathered many storms. In the current environment, clients are looking for safe solutions for their money, and we have met those needs. Through FDIC insurance, corporate asset management, insured cash sweeps, and many other services, we are well positioned to safeguard your funds. Our team expertise is a differentiator as well, and you have the benefit of many experienced banking professionals who partner to bring the best solutions to every client experience. As a private bank, we're probably best known for our exceptional personal attention. In fact, we have a specific team assigned to our top clients to ensure that we deliver a strong service premium that transcends industry norms. And Rachel will talk more about this as it relates to our premier client group. Next slide, please. Finally, we deliver personalized solutions to each relationship. On the deposit side, we can support complex business needs or the simplest consumer account. We work collectively to ensure that every client is aware of our full capabilities so we can best support yours and their evolving needs. Next slide. This slide takes you through some of our commercial and business solutions. And the next slide transitions to our personal deposit solutions. We would welcome the opportunity to talk to you more about, about these solutions and invite you to reach out if we can help in any way. And now I will turn it over to Rachel Ela to discuss our premier client group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. Next slide, please. So I'm here today to speak to you about the Premier Client Group and how it supports our legacy in supporting relationships with individuals as well as nonprofits, businesses throughout our communities. So we recognize that as you heard from Ryan, there's a lot to pay attention to, not only in the markets, but in your day-to-day -day life. And so when it comes to individuals that have over a million on deposit with us, we understand that a higher level of attention and expertise is required in order to allow you to focus on the things that are most important to you. So what we've done is we've stepped out and made a premier client group specifically to focus on those individuals. It's going to provide a differentiated experience that many may notice is now lacking in our market now that some have exited um, our communities. It provides a dedicated team for onboarding and servicing with exclusive membership benefits and products. It offers a higher level and different responsiveness for proactive support. And then we collaborate with Wealth to be present for all of your holistic needs. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about uh, why this was important uh, to put together. 
Ryan talked about there are things to worry about. You heard from Carrie that it is important now more than ever to have a safe and secure place to keep your money and your relationship. There's new technology out there on a consistent basis. And we are the experts that are here to support you and your needs. So some of the things that we have experienced recently is in March, many folks may have been aware of the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. And the approach that we took was our team proactively reached out to clients who may have had a level of concern that they had not experienced in many years. We were there to educate, go over their specific needs, and then talk about solutions that were specific to what was going to answer their concerns uh, and move them forward so that they could get back on track with the rest of their life. Um, Established response plans for sensitive events and error resolution, that's exactly that. Also, folks may experience fraud uh, as they go about their day-to-day -day life. We are here to ensure that instances of fraud do not interrupt that day-to-day -day life and that you can reach out to the banker that you know and trust in the same way that you know and trust your wealth advisor for those answers. On the next slide, we start to introduce our premier client group. This is a group between the next two slides of six individuals that among the six of us, we have 124 years of experience in banking. Now, what that means is that you're dealing with a group of professionals that have developed relationships, they have managed teams, they have been through uh, 20 plus years of the ups and downs of the economy and all that that has meant as far as breakthroughs in technology, new approaches and client experience, and uh, the latest and greatest in products, those folks are coming together with their own specialties to support the Premier Client Group membership, whether it's nonprofits, innovation, or high net worth individuals. On the next slide, actually one more, thank you. We'll just begin to share the fact that we are here as partners along with the wealth team that you already have a relationship with. If you're interested in hearing more about the Premier Client Group, whether it's the current rates and specials for our deposits, what the onboarding and the special business and personal account experience is like, or more information about the group in general, we encourage you to reach out to your wealth advisor for more information. We truly appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff so that he can walk us through questions and answers. Jeff. Great, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Ryan. Uh, we did get many questions. So Rachel, I'm gonna stick with you. Um, two questions really that kind of dovetail nicely is, is the Premier Client Group new? to Cambridge Trust, or we always had it. And I think you touched on this, but please reiterate, if um, you become a member of the Premier Client Group, does that mean I no longer work with my wealth relationship manager? Yeah, both great questions. So yes, the Premier Client Group is new. While we are a private bank, this specific focus, we're organizing it in a different way than we have previously. So this is an elevation of the service model we already provide. The group is actually going to formally launch in January. However, our team is already out there providing this experience and support to folks that are in the portfolio uh, as it stands right now. As far as working with the group, the premier client group relationship managers are really the people in the middle of the team that pull all of your advisors together. So the answer is no, you would not walk away from your wealth advisor. We are their partners. We work in a cohesive partnership to ensure that we're advising you on every angle of your banking need and your wealth needs. Great, thank you, Rachel. Ryan, you received a bulk of the questions. They came in fast and furious. Let me just start with this one that seems to be a common theme is, how are you managing risk in client portfolios? And what steps are you taking to preserve capital? I guess in general. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really sort of portfolio management 101. It's maintaining 
proper diversification, adhering to the asset allocation and account objectives that are in place for each specific client. Every client has a different risk tolerance, so making sure we're aligned in terms of the types of stocks we own for each particular client, making sure that they have the right mix of stocks, bonds, cash, alternatives, uh, and, and being thoughtful about um, uh, tax management in some cases. So, uh, you know, risk management entails a lot of different things, but a lot of blocking and tackling, making sure that we manage position sizes right, we manage sector sizes uh, properly, uh, and, and just maintain sort of, you know, I think one of the most important things is just a consistent approach to managing money. Um, so making sure that you're being very consistent with your process, uh, which is something that we do every single day. So uh, I'd call it portfolio management 101 for the most part. Great. And a follow-on question, um, which market sectors have the most growth potential? The question was in the near term, but I'll let you feel that however you see fit. <laughs> Uh, it, it's a good question, and I would say that the um, the stocks and the sectors with the most growth potential currently trade with the highest PE multiples, and that would be technology. So if you look forward, the technology sector uh, probably represents one of the better growth areas within the market. There are more cyclical areas that maybe have better short-term uh, performance or short-term growth, uh, but on a sustainable basis, I would say technology is probably number one. Number two uh, would be industrials. And I think the industrial sector has a major tailwind behind it from some of the things we talked about, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, where we're seeing major manufacturing um, opportunities, semiconductor fabs being built all across the country, more um, uh battery plants, more car uh, manufacturing plants. So I think the industrial sector um, has, a, has a significant tailwind behind it as well. So those would probably be the two top uh, sectors in terms of growth opportunities in the near to intermediate term. Great, I have more for you, but we'll give you a chance to breathe. Carrie, I do yes. have a question for you. The team has a question for you. Um, I think you touched on this, but if you could elaborate what options um, are there available for deposit protection and really ensuring the safety of a client's account here at the bank? Sure. Thank you, Jeff. Um, great question. You know, we there are many, many solutions and um, we have many experts um, on our team who can help with deposit solutions specifically that provide deposit protection that have FDIC insurance, including CDARs, you know, for CDs and um, IntraFi for money market accounts and savings and checking accounts. These networks place funds at other banks to get full insurance while you maintain a relationship with us. Um, and these have been assisting many of our clients over the last few months. There's also other options that we can pursue through our treasury management division and wealth. Um, and we can get into those with specific client needs in mind. Uh, hopefully that answers the question, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, it sure does. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, coming back your way, and I, you did touch on this during your presentation, but I think it's the question that's on everybody's mind is, is the economy going to avoid a recession this year? And maybe a follow on to that question is, is there a risk, a risk of deflation or stagflation? Um, well, I would say, hopefully, we're going to avoid it this year. I think the odds are have grown um, more in favor of the soft landing scenario. Um, but I, it's certainly not out of the cards. And I think that um, prudence would be that we should be expecting, you know, the, 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 the job picture to get worse in the near term. We're starting to see some cracks. We've talked a little bit about consumer spending coming down. Uh, so that's something that we also need to, to worry about. And, and in reality, uh, if you look back through history, the Fed has never been able to manufacture a soft landing. They raise rates until something breaks. So Fed cycles typically don't end of old age. They they end when something breaks. And that's usually a sign that things have gone too far. So um it's a it's a tough one. I think our, you know, our internal macro sort of uh, perspective would be we're not out of the woods yet. 
and to be diligent and to be thoughtful of there are risks out there, growing risks. Um, so we'll see. I think, like I said, the fact that, and this gets into the second part of the question, the fact that we've been able to bring inflation down while maintaining a relatively full job market, it, it has to be deemed somewhat successful, right? Unlike China and some of the data that came out of China this week and last week is deflationary and stagflationary. They're, so, they're showing much slower growth uh, and in falling inflation, I mean, it's 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 a bad combination. The United States is actually showing pretty decent GDP growth. It's not three percent, but it's one and a half to two percent, which again is back to trend. Um, I think we've done a good job. We still have an inflation problem. We need to uh, uh, we need to uh, adjust or get you know adhere to. Um, we need to be diligent. Uh, there's a CPI number coming out tomorrow, and the expectation is going to pop up a little bit. So I don't think these things will move in a straight line. I think we need to be very on top of, or our Federal Reserve needs to be on top of things uh, to make sure that we don't go too far, but that they're continuing to remain diligent uh, and keep a, a lid on inflation. So I hope that answers the question. Great. I do have two more. I don't know if you have statistics on this one, so I almost hesitate to ask. But there was a question in the Q&A about greater by volume, auto loans, student loans, credit card debt. Um, don't expect you to know that off the top of your head, but do you have a sense? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because there was a data point this week that credit card debt exceeded $1 trillion this week or last week, total credit card debt. Um, so again, that number is rising. Uh, student loan debt, I believe, is the highest. I think that's $1.5, $1.8 trillion. And auto loans fall somewhere in the middle. So I think student loan, in terms of outstanding balances, student loans would be the highest, followed by auto, followed by credit cards. Great. Thank you. Yep. And I'll, I'll end on this question because I think it's the, um, I know we've all been fielding question on interest rates. Uh, and you touched on it, but maybe you can finish with um, how are how are you viewing the opportunity around fixed income? I know you're the director of equities, but if you could field that question about the opportunity set on the fixed income side, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, clearly it's it's a lot better. Right? There, 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 there's the previous decade in in communicating with clients. You know, we go back to that TINA acronym you could get more income from owning the S&P 500 than you could by owning a 10-year treasury. Um, so it, it was not, and inflation was running around 2%. So you're after, uh, you know, adjusted return was basically zero. The world has changed. It's changed pretty dramatically. And, and 500 uh, basis points of rate hikes has reset the bar for people who need current income and people who want to invest in fixed income. Uh, High-grade investment credit, you can get 7% in some cases in high-grade investment credit with very, very little risk. Um, so again, as part of a, of a portfolio, a bond portfolio, stock portfolio, comprehensive wealth portfolio, you know, bonds for the first time in over a decade uh, should have a, a, a nice position within client portfolios, especially those with, with income needs. Um, you know, there are there uh, just to, to round this point off, and, and I know everybody's aware of this on the call, but money market rates are yielding 5%. And, and you know, you can leave your money in cash and earn 5%, and that's great. Um, if the Fed does go too far and needs to start cutting rates, that 5% will quickly adjust downward. So uh, our, our portfolios have actually been locking in, uh, extending a little bit of duration and locking in you know, lot higher rates, uh, just with the expectation that we're nearing the end of the Fed cycle. And, and, and you know, rates may be getting close to peaking here at this point. So great. Hope that was the uh, right answer. We'll see. Thank you, Ryan. We did receive one last question, and I promise this one wasn't planted, but it does say, what's the minimum balances required for wealth management and premier banking? And what are the fees for the two services? So, Rachel, I'll let you go first on Premier Client Group, and then I will answer the question on wealth management. 
Sure. On the Premier Client Group, the uh, deposit level is a million dollars on deposit, and that can be either uh, personally or a business or nonprofit can hold those deposits. And there are no fees to participate in membership for the Premier Client Group. Great. Thank you, Rachel. And on the wealth management side, um, to receive our full-blown relationship management services, the minimum is $1.5 million. Uh, the fees are banded. They start at 1%, and they actually go down based on the assets under management that you have under um, our discretion, if you will. Um, and I will also add, we do have a managed mutual fund program. Um, it doesn't come with the same you know, client service level, if you will, that does go lower than one and a half million. But for the full-blown service, it's 1.5 million. And then the last question as part of that was, how do you differentiate yourself from our competition? And I think it goes back to my opening comments. So I just arrived here three months ago and I'm super impressed with the level. And I think you've seen it with Ryan, uh, with our investment management capabilities. Um, it is institutional class. It's world-class investment management. And you couple that with our fiduciary experts, our team of relationship managers, both on the wealth management side of the house, as well as on the premier client service side. Uh, what you'll find is I don't think you'll get a higher level of client service coupled with that institutional and fiduciary uh, practice that we can offer. So it really comes down to being able to offer a competitive investment solution coupled with the highest level of client service, and then that whole private banking um, service that's attached to the wealth management side. There's a void in the marketplace right now between uh, with private banking and wealth management, and Cambridge Trust delivers both at an, ex at an exceptional client level service. So I will stop there. I don't want to be too salesy. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to thank our clients. Uh, you're the most important uh, contingent here for us. Um, I want to thank our employees here at Cambridge Trust. Uh, we, we have a great team. And I also want to thank our other referral sources, the accountants and attorneys that uh, have placed trust in us as well. So we will end there. We thank you for your time and have a great evening. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening.